please state your name for the record and be sure to fill out a witness form. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Randy Dolman. I serve as a protection chief with the Missouri Department of Conservation. And there's a lot here to unpack and clarify. There's a lot of good questions that are being asked, and I want to do my best to help answer those for you and clarify some information that was delivered earlier. Um, first of all, to start with, um, I've got some letters from landowners in Missouri here that I want to read in just a little bit, but I want to provide a brief opening statement and then uh, follow up on some misinformation that was presented earlier, if that's acceptable that's that's the committee. Okay, thank you. So if, if you all realize that approximately 93% of the state of Missouri is in private ownership, therefore it follows that most wildlife resources and most of Missouri's hunting and fishing activities occur on private land. The Department of Conservation's efforts to protect and manage wildlife for Missourians would be severely crippled if conservation agents were required to obtain probable cause, permission, or a warrant before entering privately owned fields, woods, meadows, or similar types of unimproved property to check for violations of the wildlife code. In the United States, wildlife is considered a public resource, independent of the land or water which they live. Government at various levels have a role in managing that resource on behalf of all citizens and to ensure the long-term sustainability of wildlife populations. Checks by conservation agents to determine compliance with the wildlife code whether on public or private lands, deter poaching, and are necessary to protect Missouri's wildlife resources. Unlike most other laws, <clears throat> violations of the wildlife code are not easily observed without first contacting the hunter or angler. Harvested game is typically stored in a coat, bag, creel, or other container, making it impossible to observe and count animals in possession. The type of firearm, ammunition, game calls, fishing lures, and other methods used to take wildlife typically are concealed or undeterminable without close observation. In most cases, permits are not openly displayed. As such, it is nearly impossible to determine if the rules are being followed until after a hunter or angler has been contacted for an inspection. So that's the, to follow up on that, most wildlife code regulations are Class A misdemeanors. They're not felonies. Now, there are some that rise to the felony level for unlawful sale and, and gross abuse of, of populations, but most wildlife code violations are misdemeanors. So the original bill that I'm here to testify against um, uh, cripples us in our ability to do our job and not only protect wildlife resources, but also to serve landowners. Now, the amended bill, we were happy to work with the representative on the, on the uh, amended version to focus on the trail camera issue that we have a problem with what happened in Tennessee as well. And I'll go into that in just a minute here. Um, but first, I want to clear up some other things that were said earlier, um, just so the committee has a full understanding of what, what the regulations are and what our policy is. So let's start with this talk about open fields, okay? There were some statements made about the barn outside the curtilage, that agents and law enforcement officers can just walk anywhere on the open, in the open fields wherever they want, go into any building outside the curtilage whenever they want. That's not accurate, all right? And we have a department policy, um, our search policy, and I want to talk about a specific part of it here in just a second that talks about agents not necessarily being able to go into a barn outside of the curtilage without a warrant. All right, so we don't want, we don't do that. And two, for the most part, we're going to get a warrant if there's something there that's of a concern to us. Uh, and so we don't just willy-nilly go across people's private property for no good reason, as Mr. Ripker testified to earlier. Um, a couple other things I want to... Uh, clear up on the question about tracking animals. Our biologists, our agents do not go on people's private property just to willy-nilly track animals. When we have a study going on, whether it's a turkey study or a deer study or an endangered species study, we work with the landowners to get permission before we do any work on their property. So the premise that agents and department folks just go all over people's private property to engage in wildlife studies without landowner permission is, is false. We work with landowners and most of the time they're very supportive of working with us on deer studies, turkey studies, that sort of thing. So I want to clear that issue up as well. Let's move on to trail cameras. So I think that is the, the, the crux of this issue and the one that's got everybody's attention and rightfully so. It got our attention as well. So when we heard about this case out of Tennessee, it was in the Ag Web article, um, it caused us as much concern as it caused you all because we don't operate that way in Missouri. And when we saw this article out of Tennessee, um, we had some concerns, and we drafted policy immediately 
to address this issue so that it would not happen in Missouri. Our officers do not trail, set up trail cameras on private property except for very limited small number of circumstances. And so Representatives, his uh, amended bill addresses what we already have in policy that was put into place immediately after this article came out about the Tennessee issue. And so we have a trail camera policy here and we're happy to pass this around. Uh, I believe Jake has those uh, at the committee's leisure. That talks about trail and un manned surveillance cameras. All right, and our policy is exactly what the representative has in his amended bill. It says conservation agents may not place and use trail cameras, unmanned surveillance cameras on private property except as follows, with the consent of the landowner or their authorized representative, or with the court order, or with prior approval of the protection branch chief, and that's me. I'm responsible for that. It's got not their frontline supervisor, not the intermediate level supervisor, but the branch chief, and that's me. And that's for those very specific situations where that might be a valuable tool to help solve wildlife crimes. And even then, there's restrictions that say that cameras placed on private property in accordance with this exception shall be placed within 100 feet of and facing towards the public location the conservation agent is conducting surveillance on. So in the rare circumstances where we have some elk poaching, for example, down in, in Reynolds County or Carter County, uh, and we think that activity is taking place maybe for, uh, on, on public property or near private property, we may set a camera up along a public roadway and there's no good tree to set it up, but the tree is on the landowner's private property within 20 feet of the road. We may set the camera up on that tree facing the road. Now you may ask, well, why don't you ask the landowner if that's okay? We may not want to tip off anybody that, that we got a camera watching the public roadway there to catch a poacher. We don't advertise that. Uh, word around, your mouth gets around pretty quick. There's other examples on, you know, working dead set nets on the Mississippi River that may be an island there that we have a dead set net that's got a bunch of illegal fish in it that's been left overnight and it's killing a bunch of game fish. We may set a camera up on that versus spending 48 hours of an agent in, in the brush doing surveillance on that. A trail camera facing that public waterway may be the issue we're trying to address. And we may not, the landowner may not be available, may not be around, it may not be practical in order to contact that landowner. So. Those exceptions for the branch chief to authorize are very limited. And in fact, since this policy was put in place in September of 2020, I've had zero requests come to my attention. And before I even, would even approve it, I would make sure there's a very good reason to do it uh, within the, that scope of the, of the policy, which mirrors the law that uh, the representative drafted for your all's consideration. So that's another issue I wanted to address with the committee. And again, we're, we were glad to work with the representative to address those concerns that you all have, that we have, that we all should have rightfully so. What happened in Tennessee doesn't happen in Missouri. I'm, we're gonna make sure it doesn't happen in Missouri um, through policy or law, whatever you all decide in this group here. Um, yeah, there was some talk brought up earlier about uh, accountability. Um, our officers are held accountable. Our policies are in place for a reason. We respect private property rights. We respect the Fourth Amendment. We also respect the open fields and Supreme Court rulings uh, on the limitations of the open fields. And there are some limitations of open fields. And so we respect that and our officers are held accountable when they violate that. There's nobody in my branch, nobody in our department that will tell you we don't hold officers accountable when they violate policy because we do. And my officers will tell you that individually and they know better. Um, and so we talk a lot about what about probable cause as, as Mr. Ripperger represented mentioned earlier, probable cause has to be developed. And to your points here, you don't develop probable cause without gathering additional information, additional evidence. Just because somebody says, Representative Sassman, I saw you poaching deer yesterday. I want to go go on your property and catch you. That's not how it works. We've got to develop probable cause. Is there carcasses out in the field? Is there blood in the air? Is there shell casings around? Is there enough evidence to build a case? And you can't do that without investigations and, and building your case. So just like in the child abuse example, you have to build that case first. And so to say, well, you just get probable cause, it's not that hard to do. It's, it's hard to build probable cause. You gotta make a strong case. Uh, and same for search warrants. Obtaining a search warrant is not the easiest thing to do in the world either. You've gotta build, you gotta have enough probable cause of a violation to get a court order for a search warrant. You gotta convince a prosecutor and convince a judge that there's significant violations there to get a search warrant. And they're not the easiest thing to do at two o'clock in the morning or you hear a spotlight or a gunshot. So that's some of what um, I wanted to clear up for the committee's 
um, benefit. And I have, I can talk for hours on why I think this is a bad Let's idea. Go. I know. Okay. I hear you. I want to respect your all's time, but I do have a dozen letters from landowners that were uh, aware of this proposed legislation who I think will speak volumes by let them speak on behalf of me. So I want to read a couple of their letters. I'm not going to read all 12 of them out of respect for your time, but I have some statements from landowners I'd like to read. Can you provide that to us in a, I can in an email? I, I'll, be, I'll be happy to. I mean, we got copies for everybody as well. But I want to read that would that would work also if you want to distribute copies. Yeah. I want to read just a couple of them and then I'll answer any questions for the committee. Okay. Benefit, if that's okay. okay. Briefly. All right. Yes, sir. This is from Keith Hilton in Ozark, Missouri. I own 410 acres in Lawrence County, Missouri. I am opposed to House Bill 1166, the original version, not the amended version. And here's why he's opposed to it. Over the years, there's been lots of criminal activity on my property and across my fence lines. The criminal activity to include dope and illegal killing of wildlife. The game warden has apprehended many people for drugs and illegal taking of wildlife on my land and adjacent land. If the original HB 1166 was in effect, none of the arrests on my property and adjacent land would have happened. Law enforcement cannot catch people involved in criminal activity if the criminals are tipped off. Furthermore, the presence of the, of the game warden on my property and adjacent property has prevented walnut timber theft and farm equipment theft. I can understand how some landowners are wanting no access to their property without permission or court order. Property rights is very important to me also. But more important to me is apprehending people involved in criminal activity. What good are property rights if thousands of dollars worth of walnut logs goes missing? What good are property rights if my farm equipment is stolen or vandalized? What good is property rights if all the deer and turkey are legally killed off? In my case, suppose the landowners who join fences with me require written permission or a judge's order for a game warden to enter their property. I can guarantee if criminals know the game warden does not have permission to enter a certain acreage, guess where the criminals will congregate? Criminals congregating my fence line means these criminals will soon be all over my land. I have experienced this very congregating of criminal activity along my fence lines already. The game warden in my case did not have his hands tied behind his back by a fence line. If a person does not want a game board to have access to his property, my question is this, what is that person hiding? Is that person growing dope? Is he cooking meth? Is he hiding stolen equipment? What happens just across my fence lines also affects me. The game board in the last few years has busted up a large scale poaching operation just across my fence line. In recent years, the game board has busted up dope operations from people crossing my fence lines. And I've got a dozen, dozen other letters that are very similar to that. I'm not going to read them here. Thank you, Bob. Questions. We've probably got a few questions here. Sure. Um, i got a couple of them for you right off the bat. Um, in the uh, proposed uh, changes, um, I'm having a hard time seeing where, um, you know, checking permits would be allowed. You know, for you would, you'd use the example of, uh, well, you need to check somebody's permit. I agree with you on that one. That's, you know, that's... Um, that's something that I hadn't thought of prior to uh, the committee meeting. Uh -huh. But so you need to check somebody's permit on private property. Yes, sir. Uh, that's not really probable cause. You're just checking a permit. So how does his uh, proposed changes address that problem? With the original bill or the or the amended no, no. bill? I'm, I'm, we've already established that the original, the way he had written the bill originally, uh, would prevent you. We, you, we think that's from, correct from checking, checking somebody's up a permit yeah, permit right but how does what's the wording in here in the proposed change that would allow for you to check the permit the open fields doctrine allows us to check the permit on the private property i'm, the I'm talking about not right now i'm talking about if he accept if if this committee accepted his changes as written here mm -hmm. how would that help you check that permit okay it's allowed in state statute it would not prevent us from checking that permit with the amended bill that's being introduced okay through state statute we can, that we can talk about that a little bit later aaron um so um you'd already talked about the limited cases which i had for you um the problem i think that at least i see from the perspective of a landowner is that i appreciate that you guys have rules but your rules change all the time and, you know, you can change a rule just simply with a meeting of the commission. And so I appreciate what you've done. Um, 
that that you responded to this problem in Tennessee rapidly to, to try to prevent that from happening in Missouri. Um, but that once again, that rule could be changed. Wouldn't you agree? You could change that rule tomorrow if you wanted to. Well, one, I don't want to. And two, I could not do that probably without department director approval. I'm even not commission talking about approval. you personally. I'm talking about the yes. commission. Yes, correct. Sir. That's okay. correct. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, Representative Basie, you're recognized for an inquiry. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you, you already said you use trail cameras. Is that correct? Yes, we do. Okay. And do you have drones, too? The department is starting to use some for management purposes. We don't have any in my protection division okay. at this time. Well, um, on your cameras, are they, say if you put one on my property and I saw it, is it clearly marked that it's the property of the department? Most of our cameras have a department inventory sticker on them. Yeah, probably okay. a CR sticker. So then I would know that it, um, you know, it's not my neighbor or, or somebody else, you know, uh, doing up to no good. Um, so I was just kind of curious if, if it would be clearly marked that this is the Department of Conservation's uh, trail cam. It may be on the inside somewhere. You might have to do a little bit of looking, but in most of those cases, we put a PCR sticker on those cameras. Okay. So if I did notice one of those cameras and I took it down, mm -hmm. what would happen? What's the penalty? Right. There'd be a, well, if it, was on, if it was in violation of our policy. If it was on my property and I took it down, shot it, Fruit in a okay. creek, what would, what would happen to me? Well, we would, <laughs> agents would knock on your door to talk about it and say, hey, what's what's going on here with our camera? And okay. we would work through that issue there. As far as what the penalty would be for taking it down and destroying it, um, I, I don't know. That would be a property damage issue or not. I, I don't I don't really know. Uh, well, I don't so think we would my, my point control. is, I'm not trying to get into an argument with you, but my point is, if, if, if I couldn't, clearly noticed that that was your all's camera, uh, it would make me pretty angry, to be honest with you. And I would probably, I probably want to take it down. I don't think I'd destroy it, but I'd, I'd take it down. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's understandable. Yeah. Again, the only time a camera would be on your property without your permission or a warrant is in very limited circumstances where it would be facing a, an adjoining public property or public waterway. Okay. Those are very limited, very rare, rare circumstances. All right, and then I, I pulled up the Agua article. Um, that was that was a uh, operation by federal officials in conjunction with the state of Tennessee. If I'm uh, that's correct, just read it. Okay, so um, you know, you you say you all don't do that kind of stuff, or you know, you don't do that in Missouri. But what you work with federal agencies on occasion? Yes, we do. Fish and Wildlife Service. So they, they could do this now? They could, but in all honesty, I'm not aware of any situation where our Fish and Wildlife Service special agents would do something like that in this state. They're focused on larger scale trafficking investigations, interstate wildlife movement, uh, commercial wildlife trafficking. Uh, they're not necessarily focused on misdemeanor wildlife code violations. Okay, and then one quick question. Problem cause, if there was two kids, teenagers, uh, walking across my farm, my permission at two o'clock in the morning with shotguns over their shoulder. Would you consider that? Would that be grounds for probable cause? Walking across your property at two in the morning with shotguns? Yeah. The agent would probably, right now, the agent would probably check to see what they are up to. Yes, they would check to see, are they, are they hunting? It's, it's odd okay. to their two in the morning, 2 a.m. with shotguns. Right. Are they, are they coon hunting? Are they poaching? Um, I, I, yes, the agent would probably follow up on that. Okay. Well, you know, I think the intent of this bill is not to prohibit you guys from doing what you do very well. But um, I do have concerns. You know, we have a lot of acreage in Howard County and, and, and some in Boone County. Mm -hmm. uh, my family does. And uh, I, don't, I would not want anybody putting a camera anywhere on my farms or my brother's farms without our knowledge. I just think that's common sense. Understood. I think it's just, it's just being polite. I agree. You know, and, uh, agree. but anyway, but I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. You bet. Representative Hayden, you're recognized for an inquiry. Just of interest, uh, how did you get, did you solicit these letters? Why weren't they sent to us as committee rather than sent to you? These, all these letters you have? 
we had let, we had landowners who were curious as to what this bill was about and the potential negative impacts that this could have on wildlife resources. And, and why weren't they sent to us rather than to you? I mean, it they, looks like it looks like you stacked the deck with your letters. That's why I'm asking. Okay. It looks like you solicited these letters and got people to send them in rather than send them to the committee because normally they'd be sent to the committee. They asked who to address those to, and when they asked me that question, I said. Rep direct that to the members of the House Conservation and Natural Resources Committee, and I would read them or hand deliver them through Jake. So if that's a procedural issue, Representative Hayden, then. And one other question, the resources of the state of Missouri, wildlife are the resources of the state of Missouri, correct? That's, yes, sir. Would you agree that some of the citizens of the state of Missouri uh, unduly uh, are taxed without representation on those animals if they eat crops? In other words, if they do $20,000 yeah, damage, I, would, would that be, is that still the state of Missouri or is that an individual that has to, is, suffers that damage? The wildlife of the state of Missouri is owned by all the people of the state of Missouri. All right, and, and so they, eat some my, they, eat my, they eat my corn and beans. Who are they owned by? The state of Missouri. So the why, of the why would Missouri. the state of Missouri pay crop damage? This is on offside, but it, it's kind of right. inside of this too, because it is private property rights. I understand. And so, if landowners are having crop damage, the department has a variety of tools to help work with them to address except, the crop except damage. Except those tools aren't paying for the damage. That's correct, sir. And, and uh, you know, it's $20,000 is not some of our citizens unduly paying for the, res the resource of the state of Missouri with crop damage. Is that, would you agree with that? That's one way to look at it. I mean, okay, but again, we're here to help landowners as much as we can. Well, and we have I, a ton, I, I, as you know, the DMAP program the DMAP helps, that, helps but address, but address that. But and prior to that, agents were working with landowners on a regular basis to issue authorization to destroy deer. But twenty or thirty thousand dollars, which fourteen dollar beans, you can get to pretty quick. So, just a point. Just understood, sir. Thank you. Last question for this witness, Representative Geyer. You're go back or anywhere. Go back to the city boy here for a minute, if that's all right. All right. All right. So. So we uh, we heard you say that it 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 would be probable cause potentially in your estimation if two kids were out at two a.m. Right? Let's let's put it in a different context. It's two in the afternoon during turkey season, and they're walking across the field, two mm -hmm. kids with shotguns. Mm -hmm. Does that change the circumstance, or is that still probable cause in your mind? Well, first of all, in Missouri, turkey season closes at one o'clock in the spring season. So they're there at two o'clock. Does that that may be an issue now? Silly me, silly me. So there you go. <laughs> so the agent might follow up on that. Now, if it's the fall turkey season, which is open all throughout the day, then no, that's not probable cause. Um, but the agent may still check them for the permits or just to see what type of gun they're using, make sure they're not can't using a rifle to turkey hunt, for example. And you can't do that without checking those individuals. I see. Okay. I think I'm out of my depth here. I'm going to stop. That's okay. That's okay. I'm happy to answer the questions I can, Mr. Thank you very much so. for uh, for the record. Sometimes it takes me longer than an hour to get out of the woods. So, uh, <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. One last question, Representative Haley. So I just want to maybe ask a question that might help clarify part of this. So our family owns some land in, in um, Rawls County. Okay. Um, I live two hours away from that. My brother lives two hours away from that in Illinois. Um, he's a primary landowner, out-of-state landowner. Um, the land borders uh, Corps of Engineer land. Mm -hmm. um, people publicly hunt on that public, or people hunt on that public land all the time. If an, if an agent uh, witnessed uh, an individual on that Corps of Engineer land that was field dressing a deer out of season, and he started going toward this individual, and this individual ran onto my brother's property, um, which is 120 acres uh, conservation reserve program pretty grown up tall grass um, could that agent follow him onto my brother's property not necessarily not not under the original it, bill that was filed all right so this if this bill's passed you'd have to have permission from the landowner my brother who is two hours away uh does not reside there and so and this land borders two gravel roads so and there's houses around uh, more than likely you could not enforce that that uh, that infraction. That's my understanding of the original bill, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, and just as a comment, then finally, um, with without we don't live in that area, and we actually have relationships with some of the enforcement officers in that area, and and ask them, please, 
you know, if you see people that cross over the line from the core land onto our private land, um, please, please check on them. They do not have permission. We have no hunting signs. There is a fence with, and there's blue or uh, purple paint on all the trees, and there's no hunting signs. But unfortunately, I've been in deer stands there myself and had people walking onto the property um, and, and mess up our hunting. I've never once been uh, had a hunt messed up by a, a law enforcement or a conservation agent of any kind. I have been checked at the gate when I walk out to the high, to the road uh, to where my vehicle is. I've had good conversations with enforcement agents there, uh, but I, I'm definitely more concerned about um, um, the people being on my property without permission and hunting and then the uh, hands being tied from the enforcement officers than I am about um, um, 